Bonsoir. Nous avons la joie Good evening. Ce soir, Tonight, it is our pleasure to welcome Frank Gehry and Jean-Louis Cohen. Une, une Do I need to introduce uh, them? Frank Gehry is the architect behind this building, which is home to the brand new world of Charlotte Perriand, an exhibition that some of you have already checked out. In these galleries designed by Franck Guéry, this is a creative journey spanning the 20th century, bringing together the different arts, architecture, design, sculpture, paintings. Jean-Louis Cohen is a is a professor at Collège de France. He is responsible for a lot of uh, publications, including an upcoming uh, publication, The Complete Works and Drawings of Frank Gehry. And we're looking forward to this book coming out. Without further ado, I'd like to to applaud and welcome these uh, two great men. We're delighted to have them with us tonight. Thank you, Sebastian. Many thanks to Fondation Louis Vuitton. Many thanks to Sophie Ullemann and Jean-Paul Clavry. Many thanks, Sebastian, in particular, for for hosting this uh, conversation, the starting point of this conversation, at this amazing exhibition dedicated to Charlotte Perriand, I will now switch to English. Welcome to your beautiful building. I designed this room for music, not for me. <laughs> okay, now you have to sing. Now you have to sing. Uh, so, so welcome uh, on the occasion of this memorable exhibition. Um, so first of all, uh, my gratitude, our gratitude for having accepted this invitation. And uh, in this wonderful place which you have designed and built, uh, which is operating for five years, um, the first point I wanted to, to address is uh, the, what I would call the, the adjustment of the exhibition to your building. Uh, is, it, is an exhibition like that something you're expecting when designing the building with its many different galleries? So how do you, what is your first uh, take at the show? Having seen the exhibition, I prayed for such an exhibition. <laughs> I think um, it's uh, magnificent. Good. Uh, so yes, because I think that you had uh, imagined uh, a building in which there were different types of galleries, and we see how the exhibition adjusts to the large rectangular galleries and also to the more idiosyncratic curvilinear galleries in the top of the building with the, the, the different departments. So, what should I say? No, <laughs> just, just a comment. But to, okay. to let you move on, I will bring you back to uh, Charlotte Perriand's place Thank on Rue Lascaz, because in, the, um, in your short but uh, very strong preamble to the big catalog of the show, you write about your lack, I'm quoting you, your lack of awareness of the breadth of Charlotte's work, end quote. But you also express your emotion upon your visit of her studio. Can you return for us to this experience you had on Rue Lascaz? Yes, I wish everybody could experience the, the uh, apartment that she designed. Um, every, every move, everything was uh, special. It felt good. I went to, it's small, so you're touching the furniture. You're, you're, you're not, it's not big space. So you're close to everything. And so inevitably you touch something and it always it felt gentle and and purposeful, like it was planned that way. So 
when you walk down the stair and put your hand on the handrail, it was uh, just very, very subtle and, and engaging and beautiful. And, uh, the whole feeling was uh, one of, of uh, soft and uh, at the same time very, very well designed, strongly designed. It wasn't by accident. It was, I think it's what we all should aspire to, to make build, develop buildings that make people comfortable. You know, that's uh, the whole modernism thing was, with minimalism is so difficult to live in, to be part of this, this uh, and so somebody like Charlotte, who was in the midst of the modernism, in the midst of all of that, to have per, per, pursued such a direction of, of trying to be uh, beautiful, uh, but uh, new, expression of new ideas. All the ideas were exciting and new. You kept bumping into a, a wall that had something on it. You, the view was always, you just, it was subtle and, and uh, but it was, there was a softness to it that I, that I liked and, and a, a welcoming and a friendliness and a, yes. and yet it was, it was new, it was architecture, it was new. So I well, this, this is a rather late uh, uh, project in our life. I mean, in the exhibition, one sees the early, early f uh, uh, studio. But I experienced that when I'm walking through the yes. exhibit as well. So maybe it was, I w the preface set me up for this, but I think walking through the exhibit, I felt the same feeling of the uh, soft, uh, uh, welcoming, uh, new ideas at the time. Uh, and uh, something comes to mind, as you've seen in, in the exhibition, uh, Charles Perrion was uh, drawn to the mountains already in the 30s. And, uh, uh, and later, when she worked on on Les Arcs, on this very large development, uh, and I, you have been on the country drawn to the sea as a sailor. I remember fantastic experiences with you in your sailboat meeting whales in the Gulf of. Not a great uh, sailor, by the way. But no, but you're you're a good skipper. You're a good skipper, <laughs> and uh, so I, I I think that the there is a parallel between uh, what Charlotte has drawn out of uh, her experience of the mountain shelter, this precisely this small condensed space. There is one example in the upper ranges of a museum. And what you did with, uh, in particular, with your big wooden boat, which is inside exactly in the same spirit. Yes, one, uh, in, in the architectural projects, you don't get that opportunity that you do. I, I realized that when I was doing the boat, I designed the uh, showers, I designed the, the, all of the handles, the things. Uh, when you're doing a project, usually you don't have that opportunity. No, no, no I, I think this is quality one meets on Rue Lasca. So we can continue to see some of the interiors which are, which are, are at, the, uh, at the exhibition. I think that one of the major uh, achievements has been the recreation of this memorable interior because uh, today when these pieces of furniture are produced by a casino and sold everywhere one tends to forget that they were part of a complete uh, scheme right right i have these chairs not exactly these but i have these at home and in the office <laughs> well all architects have uh, have them but uh, well, Not thanks, everybody does not. Thanks to thanks to the work of uh, Arthur Rueg, this has been a great this is a great great achievement in the exhibition. Another reconstruction, which I uh, I think very uh, interesting, is this um, uh, 
uh, reconstruction of uh, Charlotte's contribution to the Brussels show of, uh, of 1935. So the interaction between art, furniture, interior space, graphics. That is a spectacular uh, work because uh, for her to be in the midst of these geniuses, these giants, and they're, and they're men, uh, so a different time, right? And uh, for her to, to maintain her uh, integrity and her persona and her, the level of her work, she matched them. And she, she moved them. It's obvious she moved them. And uh, that's a spectacular thing. You know, I, that doesn't happen much. I've tried to collaborate, but it doesn't, the opportunities to collaborate with artists Artists today have uh, Gagosian and people. And <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Uh, one thing I want to say about this interior, 1935, 1936, 37, very intense days for Fran in French politics, in the world politics, with uh, Hitler raising. Charlotte is definitely on the left. Yeah. Uh, she's a radical. And, uh, and I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to question you about this aspect also of your, of your life. From your, the 1950s in Los Angeles, uh, in the uh, coldest moment of the Cold War, uh, to this day, you've been drawn to uh, radical politics, even defining yourself a socialist sometimes. What, uh, what can you say about to this, to this audience? Who, uh, people here, I don't think, perceive that aspect of your position. Of course, you have not built thousands of social housing units, but your attitude towards the city and towards public program has been informed by this position. Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, the profession of becoming an architect, it behooves one to, uh, to think of people, and people are all kinds of people, not just rich people. And uh, my, in my earliest work, uh, I worked with people who, including myself, who did not have any large amounts of money. So uh, building my own house, building uh, the, the, Ron Davis's studio, uh, they were, there was minimal funds, it was always, um, et je m'y sentais à l'aise. So we won't question you on your Donc, take at uh, American politics today, but uh, I, uh, I have intuition that you're not exactly a supporter of the president, of the current president. Well, I could go into a thing about it, and then I'll get in trouble. Last time I did, I, I had. Uh, had to have guards. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, President Obama gave you the Medal of Freedom service. So Obama, that was before. Yes, before. That's what, that was before. Okay, so, uh, yes, you've seen that the uh, moat of your building here has been used to exhibit uh, Charlotte's uh, uh, house by the water. Because that little building was never built before. She never saw it, right? No. Uh, one could live there. That uh, fantastic little structure. With, uh, but again, it has that welcoming humanity uh, touch, uh, feeling of well of of well-being, feeling of uh, embrace, feeling of what she stood for, right? And also, uh, if, we, if we focus on the technology, it's also a lightweight structure, prefabricated, which uh, in my view uh, uh, has a connection with uh, the way you, you had experience with the wooden frame, with your interest for prefabrication, which never went very far, but maybe uh, I'm thinking of a tract house of the early 80s, which you had envisioned as a, as a prefab, um, 
houses which could completely renovate the architecture of the American excerpts. Yeah, yeah. well, I had this fantasy we could build these one-room uh, buildings and uh, have uh, 10 different designs and have people choose those, they, could, they would be prefabricated and then they could be assembled uh, to form a, form a complete house or complete dwelling. Uh, we've never been able to. Not yet. Not yet, we're Not working yet. on it. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I think the, par the parallel can be can be ex uh, expanded. I don't want to be too uh, boring about it. But if you think of the modular aspect of this house, there is something of the same idea. But the house doesn't need to be a unit. After all, your first most remarkable uh, domestic projects in the 19, late 1970s were uh, projects in which you fragmented the program of the house and worked on uh, uh, on autonomous units, which you then recom recompose in a much looser manner than Charlotte, but in the same spirit. Which house is that? No, I'm thinking of the late houses of the uh, house for a filmmaker, or even uh, uh, the houses, uh, uh, the Benson house, etc. Houses oh. in which you had, uh, in a way, exploded the compact unit of the house. Yes, the the little Benson house was the best one, where there, there was a family, uh, a, a lawyer, a teacher uh, at Loyola Law School, and his wife, and they had two daughters. And so I created a two-story um, box with the parents on top, and then the, the, the girl's bedroom below. And it was a separate building, and then the living room and dining room and kitchen were a separate building. So the parents could have a party, and the kids could sleep, or the kids could have a party, and the parents could sleep. <laughs> um, that really worked. And, and I wanted to put a terrace on the top, which never got built, but. Well, it, I think it's a memorable one in this series. So now let's move east, east fr from Paris, west from Los Angeles, where you were. Um, the, sh the, the exhibition is extremely uh, uh, spectacular in its consideration of Japan. Uh, uh, I remember uh, first experience uh, in Saint Etienne, where an exhibition organized, curated by Jacques Barsac, uh, explored the Charlotte's connection to Japan, where she spent two years at the beginning of the European War, because the beginning, of, well, Japan had, had started before, uh, but. Uh, continued later, and Japan was extremely central in her reconsideration of mat the materiality of buildings, so uh, of, of uh, furniture in particular. Uh, the bamboo interpretation of her chaise longue on the right is, uh, I think, a remarkable uh, shift in her, in her work. So we see that in the show, and we see that also, yes, we see in the show all these pieces uh, put together as they had been ex uh, already exhibited in, in Tokyo in 1941. So my, my question is, is to you is um, uh, about your relationship to Japan. And uh, I will start with uh, this project you did uh, in 65. So it's not long, it's only tw less than 25 years after Charlotte's exhibition in Tokyo. Uh, it was your first installation at the newly opened uh, County Museum in Los Angeles on uh, um, uh, ancient art of Japan. So can you, can, can you explain why Japan was so special for you and your generation in Los Angeles after the war? Well, the, our teachers uh, at the architecture school were uh, <coughs> had just come back from the army and, and uh, uh, some of them came, had spent time in Japan on their military service at the end of the war. And LA was building tract houses. So as far as the eye could see, you would see tract houses under construction with, made of two by fours out of wood 
uh, framing, and it was uh, ubiquitous. You couldn't av av avoid it. And so it was s these, pe these people coming back, like Gordon Drake and, and uh, uh, people like him, that uh, saw the, having seen Issei Shrine, having seen Katsura Palace, having seen the, the work in wood and the simplicity and the warmth of it, it was easily uh, adopted. And so many of the houses and, and buildings of the, of, during my first years in architecture school were uh, models that we were, uh, our teachers were building, were working on, and it was very easily assimilated uh, it was an aesthetic that became very powerful, and it was user-friendly. It was uh, respectful of humanity. It wasn't antithetical to humanity. It was. It had uh, warmth and feeling, and and uh, so I became very. Even my first buildings, uh, first houses that I did, looked like I was a Japanese architect, maybe. <laughs> um, I even uh, was became interested in their, uh, of course, in the art and, and music and the uh, Hiroshiga Hokusai uh, prints, the Japanese prints, and uh, and I joined uh, UCLA had an ethnomusicology department, and I joined the Gagaku Orchestra, which is the Imperial Court music, and and. Uh, there was a little frame with a metal thing. It looked like a frying pan. And I had two mallets, and the sound went and I did clink, clink. I was the clink, clink. <laughs> and uh, they sent a Japanese uh, expert, sensei, they called him, to teach me how to breathe when I played this instrument. <laughs> so I was in it over my head, Japan, times 10. And so uh, if you go to Disney Hall, the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which was a more recent, one of my projects, uh, we brought the Gagaku Orchestra to that hall. And they stood on stage, and my building looked like a Japanese temple. So <laughs> I think it's in, the, it's in the bones, it's in my head, it's, you know, you had, you and have, I, I'm happy about it. <laughs> you have metabolized Japan. Yeah, and I, and so I could understand why Charlotte, having worked with Corbusier and the modernist, strict modernism and uh, and the, the aesthetics, the interior aesthetics of Corb, which were uh, concrete, like the Maison Shaoul and. Uh, and some of the other smaller buildings, uh, how she could find herself uh, sed seduced by the Japanese uh, aesthetic, the uh, the way of, the way of life, the thinking, and so on. No, I I I think that the exhibition gives a very good view of that. There is another aspect. But that that chair, the chairs in the middle, yes. the, the one in the middle. Yes. This one? Yes, so it has the slats. And I did a series of furniture for Noel. We'll see them. We'll but see I them. never uh, saw that before. You had never seen it? I don't seen think it. so. Maybe I did. Yes. You know. <laughs> Maybe you had a, a sort of mental imprint. This is what you did. This is what you did. So There's certainly a connection. <laughs> yes, there is a hidden connection. Uh, yes, Charlotte also worked for uh, interiors which were relatively modest, mass-produced, in particular the students' uh, quarters at the Cité Universitaire, uh, where she worked with uh, Jean Prouvé, uh, who uh, produced them on uh, extremely uh, simple and yet very refined furniture. Uh, and this leads me to, to, to mention your furniture work and to, uh, to ask you what you have, what, maybe to, 
to to recall the context, but to um, to reflect on what the design of furniture has uh, made for you as an architect. And I re re remind everyone here that Frank basically worked on three series of uh, furniture um, of uh, uh, three ranges. Like can you believe it? I look yes, you did that. You did that. You look like that. Yes, when I, when I've met you, first met you, you were like that. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first series, so-called Easy Edges, with, which is based on. Uh, well, this is. I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, I was designing a department store for a Magnum company in in America. In, in, on on uh, in the south of Los Angeles, Costa yeah. Mesa, and, uh, San Jose, or so. They, at the time, the fashion industry has quick turnover of of uh, things that that were important, like wigs and then something else. Accessories. So uh, the the uh, they had within a year they had to destroy their fixtures and build new ones. So it was always. Uh, changing and and it was expensive so I thought of making it out of why not make them out of cardboard paper and so when you if you're thinking structurally efficiently if you just fold the cardboard it it's strong it holds this thing so I made some things out of that but I was we were making our models for, of contours for the land out of layers of cardboard. And the end was, was, uh, of it looked, was very seductive. And so I decided to try and make a, a use that as an idea and, and slowly found a way to make it efficient and it was very strong and it felt like corduroy, felt like fabric. So it did all of those things, and it had uh, uh, it had resilience. It it bounced, so when you sat on it, it moved. And and so I made a bunch. Of, uh, first, I made fixtures for the store, and then uh, started making these this furniture, which got me into a lot of trouble with with the business. Uh, I've, I had a partner uh, who was the chairman of East Saint Laurent, <laughs> who supported this, but I wasn't ready for for the big business time, so I I screwed it up, kind of. Uh, well, anyway, you you seem to have had a great anxiety at the idea of becoming a, a furniture designer and no longer an architect. But well? the but the thing that got to me was. Uh, and I forget, one of the great furniture designers did a chair that was six pounds. Joe Ponti, the su super light chair by right, Joe Ponti. Right, 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 right. So I thought, and I loved that chair, so I thought a chair should be at least six pounds. Mm. So I made that a, a challenge for myself. and. So that's how I got to the, the knoll. Yes, so, so you have a second series, which is this one, in which cardboard takes a different shape. Yeah, this was unexpected, uh, and it's a longer story. I don't think you want to hear about it, but... <laughs> no, we want to hear everything. Uh, and then you have a knoll well, series. Well, I'll tell you the story yes. briefly. So briefly. <laughs> a gallery in New York at the time had a show of Michael Graves' drawings, and they were beautiful. And so the second show, he had asked me to have my, my drawings. So I sent him 150 of my drawings, and he called me and said, that's shit, I can't show that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, fine, I don't have to do the show. He said, yes, but we've announced at the time you have to do something. <laughs> so. The chair on the left, I decided to do stuff with that. And in, a, in my office, a few of us started playing with that as kind of a 
sculpture that wasn't serious, but then we made a bunch of a chaise, a bunch of different pieces, and we shipped them. He had the show. I got through it, and then uh, I don't know what happened to the pieces. But <laughs> then we made we used the thinner pieces and made the one on the right. So. Which, which is called beaver. No? I forget what yes, we beaver. called them, yeah. something. And then, uh, a few years later, uh, how did this happen? Because it's a significant shift in respect to well, the previous uh, ones. Uh, the Noel, uh, Noel people called me through uh, Barbara Jacobs, yes. who is an uh, uh, important figure in the New York art world. And she asked me if I would do a project for Noel, and uh, so I set up a shop and started with the laminated wood, and we we made them all ourselves in our in our office, and um, did a whole collection. But the final chair that was six pounds is not in this group. <laughs> I got to six pounds. Great, so you managed to. It's similar to the chair second from the left. Yes. Except without the uh, diagonals in it. So you finally met the challenge, and also they went into pro mass production, these ones. They went into production, yeah. Uh, another, yes, uh, I don't, just for the record in the, in the show, we see also how Charlotte, in the later part of her trajectory, works on very large projects, in particular this. Uh, this I was surprised. Yes. By. I didn't know at all. You know that. Uh, which, is, yes, it came about uh, a little later uh, after your, the time you had spent in Paris. And uh, she worked at both scales, that what makes the project interesting. A little bit like what you've done in some of your uh, designs. Uh, there is a, a general scheme in the landscape, but at the same time, there is an interest for the components, for the units inside. But they're like, they could be adapted to social housing. Yes, absolutely. And the, and the uh, prefab bathroom would be, uh, we should make those in Los Angeles for the homeless, because... Well, no, this Why is not? a missed opportunity to be met again. No, but that's what's needed now, desperately, this, the, these uh, designs that she made. But you've been engaged, um, yes, this is an, another topic, since we're to talking about uh, the large scale. Uh, can, can you tell us what you have been doing in Los Angeles in the past years with the LA River project? Because it's a project no one knows very well. It's in part secret, but uh, uh, Frank has been engaged in a... How much time do we have? <laughs> As we have enough time. We can... If, I'm sure that if we spend the night here, we will bring sandwiches. <laughs> the Los Angeles River is 51 miles long. And I lived in L.A. a long time, and I knew it was there, and I never paid much attention to it. A few... Five years ago, probably, a group of people came to me and said that New York has built a high line. And uh, it's been very successful. And we have 51 miles of river. Can't we, can't we monetize it? Can't we make it more valuable and usable and accessible and so on? And uh, would you be interested in helping us? So this became, ultimately became philanthropy, because I didn't get paid for it. I, I got into it and could, couldn't get out of it. <laughs> and I'm still in it. Um, the, I told him that the New York uh, uh, High Line is a rusted railroad bridge that could be thrown away or could be used. And it, they, they did nice things with it. They made a walkway and put plants on it. And that was different than the river, which is, I assumed, was a flood control project. Sure. 
So we started a study uh, because there's a, a big movement in LA that believes that the LA River can be used for uh, developing habitat for frogs and and uh, butterflies and uh, and uh, fish and so on, and that it also can be used for recreation. And the statistics that you get are that uh, it only the uh, if you study it, there was the river was spreading all over the plain and was flooding LA. In, in the 30s, they built a channel, concrete channel, to contain the river to hold uh, for the 100 year flood, which they created a, a metric that a 100 year flood could be taken care of within this channel. Uh, it's in that channel that people wanted to put trees and so on and create because it's only 2% of the time that it floods. The rest of the time, it's, it's empty. And so it's very, it's very enticing to do something in it for the 98% the of the time. Um, we studied it. Uh, we studied all of it. There's, there's issues of uh, public health uh, related to it, there's issues of uh, water reclamation in a in a city that needs to have water. That's that could be a, a water uh, without water if there was uh, uh, difficulties, and and so uh, we studied all of the issues related to this 51 miles. Uh, south of Los Angeles, uh, all the way to the ocean, the, uh, the open space for uh, parks and things does not exist. So children growing up in that area have a shorter lifespan by as much as 10 years than people that live in the other parts of the city. Uh, so we, we focused on all of, all of those things. We looked at uh, what you could do in the channel and are there ways for when the 100 year flood comes to spread the water. And in order to do that, the water would spread and flood all, all the areas. And we found out that if you plant grass, just grass in the bottom, when the 100 year flood comes, it spreads the water five times the width of the channel. So it's not safe. And even with those statistics and that, those facts, the people in Los Angeles still believe that they can use it for, so you can't plant trees, you can't even plant grass. So the difficulty in what can you do and so we focused on the areas where there are no park space, where there's the lifespans are shorter, and decided to propose to cover the channel, so let the river be its flood control, cover it, it's 600 feet wide, and make a park on top. Uh, and this is what we're studying, and we're getting approval from the, the uh, politics. Uh, as part of it, we were, we were making the cover in, in the area where, the, where the, there is a, a Latino, African American population mainly. And they were, they were intending to build a community center. We've convinced them to build a cultural center. And we're bringing uh, Youth Orchestra LA, which is Gustavo Dudamel's uh, I did recreation of where he came from in Venezuela, El Sistema, the orchestra, and the art. El Sistema, which is a program for p people from the people doing music and yeah. having access. And to And even it. now, under the dictator, this El Sistema still exists. A, a million children are being taught, and it's amazing. Uh, uh, this is where where. 
the socialism really works because these kids uh, are um, uh, from all, all areas, from wealthier fa families, from poor uh, children with mental uh, handicaps, children with physical handicaps, uh, the, the mentally handicapped are brought into the orchestra. They're, they become part of the orchestra. They're, they're taught to, to hit gongs and to play. Uh, it's a, an extraordinary experience to see it. So Gustavo wanted to recreate that. So we're going to do that on this river. And we're going to add a component of social housing. Uh, the problem is if you cover it and make a park, we're worried about the gentrification that will come with that. And so we're, we're, try, we're trying to be careful. And so we want to build housing. Uh, one of the supervisors discovered that there are a possibility of converting the, the low, lower cost motels that are in those neighborhoods into housing for the homeless and the economics works. And we found in this neighborhood where we're working 120 uh, motels. So that's several thousand. So we're, we're providing, and then as part of it, uh, I've been working on an arts education program uh, of uh, bringing art programs into the elementary schools. So. In the United States, um, it's, it's required by law that, that uh, elementary schools have an arts program from kindergarten to the eighth grade. And it does not exist in reality at all. So the American Civil Liberties Union is now bringing a lawsuit. I don't know what good it'll do with the current administration, but it's, uh, it's something, in California alone, there are 300 schools where children drop out in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And it's a serious issue. And if you follow the statistical, what happens to those children as they grow up, many of them end up in jail, and I, we, gone to the jails and met met these people in jail. So, uh, so this river becomes a catalyst for doing all of these uh, these things, and uh, a lot of my days are spent in. Yeah, and I think it's a very important commitment to a city where you've spent uh, your life and where, which was also ignoring you for a long period of time. So. Now you have a series of major projects coming, coming up, but also yeah, this yeah. engagement with burning social issues. So we've, we've not publicized it very much, so Joseph, don't write about it yet. Yes, <laughs> I think you should do more with it. So let, let's you go. You already have. <laughs> let's, let's go back to, uh, to uh, art and design. Uh, one of, one, one of uh, the fabulous contribution of this exhibition is uh, uh, showing how Charlotte Perignon interacted with major artists uh, from Fernand Léger to uh, uh, with whom the relationship was very uh, long. But you knew her. How did she do it? How? Well, she met him in the Paris was a small city in the 1930s, so they were in the same left-wing artistic circles in the same organizations and. Uh, liked each other, so you've seen how they worked in parallel on their, uh, on the, um, for instance, the study of natural objects, the relationship between her photogra photographs and Leger's paintings. Are you astonished? Yes. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is a photo I like very much of Leger on the left, Charlotte, uh, immediately uh, by him. Uh, Le Corbusier and Pierre Jeanneret. But this, this kind of collaboration, I, I don't see it happening now. Well, we'll talk about it uh, in, in one second. So uh, she continued to work 
uh, on, in the 50s on the idea of the synthesis of the arts. This, this is also a theme represented in the exhibition, a sort of joint presence of art and, and, uh, and design objects in an interior. She continued to, um, she was also active in the realm of museums, like you have been uh, uh, installing 12 or 13 shows for the Los Angeles County Museum. And this is an installation she did for uh, Besset, who was a great uh, art and architecture historian, uh, uh, active in the staff of Henri Malraux in the, in the late 50s. And now uh, I wanted to um, uh, let you speak a little bit about how you have uh, worked with artists in different manners. So this is uh, a collaboration. You, you, you look at Klaus Oldenburg with a sort of, sort of fatherly glance while he's modeling something in your office uh, here. So um, you have often been characterized uh, as an artist among the architects. Uh, and you've said yourself, uh, once, tw 2004, I came at architecture through fine art, and painting is still a fascination for me. Paintings are a way of training the eye. You see how people compose a canvas, the way Bruegel, Bruegel compose a canvas or J composes a canvas or Jasper Jones. I learned about composition from their canvases. I picked up all those visual connections and ideas. Especially uh, my early beginnings was uh, Rosenberg. Bob, Bob was doing the combines, and that had a. Uh, it, it made sense in that time, and it had rele relevance to what I call cheapskate architecture. <laughs> yeah, cheapskate architecture in French, une architecture de radin, yeah. uh, was one of the theme of Frank in the I mid 70s. Yeah. Yes, and your house, in a way, your Santa Monica house belongs to that moment. Yeah. But uh, what can you say about this, which is a later, uh, it's for me a tr tr very troubling relationship. Morandi on the left, and uh, uh, and the textile character of this extraordinary project, which was not built for the Lewis House on the right. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. Because I, uh, Morandi was very uh, moving to me, that, that, and that's what led to the idea of the tract house, of the separate uh, pieces that could, and I built uh, some stuff like that where the individual uh, pieces could stand beside each other in the sense like a Mirandi. Um, this was a house that never got realized. Maybe it's better it didn't, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, it took you five years not to build it, but you learned a lot. Yeah, but I, the, the, the research was that uh, modernism hit a dead end. My friends went back to the Greek temples, the postmodernism. Uh, Philip Johnson did the AT&T. Uh, uh, Etc. <laughs> uh, and I remember giving a lecture, and 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 some of these people that did that were in the room, and I said. Why do you have to go back the, to Greek temples? If you have to go back, if you, if you don't know where else to go, you could go back 300 million years to fish. And I don't know, that just came out of my head like I, un, unplanned. And I realized that I was, later that I was searching for a way to express, express the times we lived in where cars, airplanes, boats, everything was moving fast around us. And that was there some com something about architecture that looked static, that could it have a sense of, of movement? Could it become, could it, uh, could a sense of movement be a 
give feeling to a building? Could it, could it create a positive uh, aesthetic that would relate to the times we're in, but also, and so, uh, long story short, I made a, for a fashion house in Italy, I made a fish 36 feet long out of wood that was embarrassingly kitsch. I um, hate to show it to you. It was embarrassing. No slide. <laughs> but when you stood beside it, you sensed the movement. And that's when I thought, ah, now. So I cut the tail off, cut the head off, cut everything, made it as simple as I could, and it still worked. So. Well, it's the beginning of a long chronicle of fish at various scales from the right. And the guy, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I went back to Japan for that too because the fish drawings by Hiroshiga uh, express movement as well, and and um, so there were a lot of issues, a lot of elements that supported this, uh, and that led. I don't know if you want me to go there, but. Oh, please. Okay, that led me to how do you build curved shapes economically, right, with, within the constraints of normal budgets. And so I found my way to a French company called Dassault. So you should be happy I came to France for that. And uh, uh, was, in, was uh, in, engaged with them and they taught, gave us this. We, I think we bought the software, uh, uh, Katia, and we were able to do these kind of shapes for less cost because by demystifying the drawings and, and showing exactly what they had to make, it was, and so the Bill Bow Museum was the second building. I did a, a, first a big fish sculpture in, in Barcelona, Barcelona uh, with an Italian company who tried to, it was just a, a turning point. They tried to work with our CAD draw, our 2D drawings, and they couldn't build that fish. And, and I remember the Italian guy I said, well, let's try Katia. And he took that away and he called me a week later and he said, perfecto. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, uh, one interesting form uh, in this family is your bank uh, uh, meeting room in Berlin, which relates to yet a much earlier moment in the history of art. So this is also the point I wanted you to uh, uh, to comment on art is not on. You've mentioned Rosenberg, Morandi, but you've also uh, mentioned Tintoretto, Michelangelo, Bernini. Here in this case, the wonderful uh, Pleurant, uh, the little statues from the grave of uh, the, from the monument to Philippe Le Hardy in Dijon. So uh, a friend of mine who is a Renaissance art scholar, uh, her Irving Levin, uh, uh, took me to Dijon to show me the Schluter uh, Plurence, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. Again, this, I think this also relates to Charlotte because uh, the softness of the forms, uh, especially that, relates to some of her, her in my mind, maybe. Uh, and uh, it, I love the, the uh, feeling of it. And so I made that big shape that is reminiscent of that form in Berlin. Let's move from Berlin uh, to Paris uh, and to a young Frank Gehry, uh, Paris young. around 1960, 61. So this, this is the, the last point I wanted to, 
uh, to talk about Frank and Paris. So can you tell us about the Paris you discovered in the 60s where you worked on it was 59. Project, 59, yeah. but where you worked on Nozelle, but you were still there at the time uh, of this, uh, well, during the final stages of the war in Algeria. So can you uh, bring us back to your Parisian life? <laughs> well, I, I was married. I had two young daughters, and, uh, an ex-wife, uh, who was very interested in, in uh, France and uh, convinced me to come to spend time in Paris. Uh, we weren't of great financial means, so it was difficult. Um, but I had a French uh, architect friend who went to Harvard when I was there, uh, Marc Bias, who's no longer with us, but uh, I was in city planning, he was in architecture, and I w we, we were met, close friends, and he was uh, invited by Robert Ozell to do a master plan for Ville Couble. I think that's where... Uh, Ville Couble, correct. Isn't that where the president... This is where the goal was shot the goal. by the OIS, yes, yeah. or in Vélizy, just nearby. Um, and so we worked on this. This was the plan we did for that. Uh, but while I was here, we met uh, Claude Perron, who had an Afro haircut. He didn't look <laughs> And uh, he was working on Paris à Côté. Paris Parallel. Paris Parallel. Paris Parallel, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I worked for, I met Ivan Jankovic and uh, who, else, who was else in that firm? Kandilis. Kandilis, well, uh, Jankovic and uh, Gozel were, part, were working together yeah. uh, at their Encyclopedia of City yes. Planning. And he was doing the Facile. The, yes. Yeah, I remember that. In that period, I got, I worked for Andre Ramonde, uh, I like to say it, 79 Avenue de Champs Elysees, <laughs> Mimi Pinson en sous. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, it was the year that Jackie uh, Kennedy came and was in the, the uh, convertible with Charles de Gaulle going up the Champs-Élysées, and we were looking out the window. Um, uh, it was an extraordinary time. We got to travel through, and that's when I became interested in, in the, the Roman, Romanesque architecture, visiting uh, Autun was especially uh, important to me, and... Vézelay. Uh, Vézelay, Tornu. 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 And uh, so it, it was an enlightenment. <laughs> uh, I actually learned, I was actually speaking French fairly well by the time, which I've f managed to forget by not using it, but I can understand a lot. Um, I think, I don't know, I'm not just saying it, I think Paris is one of my favorite places to be. But it took you a long time to, to return. You were, you returned on the wings, wings of Walt Disney. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't, be, don't be sorry, it's the best part of, uh, it's the best part of the Paris Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, the interesting thing is with, when you work for Walt Disney at that time when they were doing the parks, uh, it didn't matter what your architecture was because when they brought in Mickey Mouse, <laughs> it took the center stage. It was more powerful than what you could do. This picture was before they brought Mickey Mouse. <laughs> 
but it still operates well. I think it's still interesting. And then, of course, there are two major buildings, the uh, American Center, which is now the Cinematheque, and this very building here. Um, uh, what, uh, what did change besides the budgets <laughs> and the size between the two projects? What, what changed in, 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 in your experience of building in Paris between uh, in, during these 10 years between, or 20 years rather, between these two projects? Um, what changed? Oof. I think this was uh, also uh, trying to play with components, separate components, but using one material. Uh, so it was inspired by what I saw in Paris. Uh, you can find corners of buildings, corners of streets. They're not exactly like this, but they have the, the feeling of that. Um, I don't know. I was, I was trying to... If I, if, if I can risk an interpretation, I think on the left, you were also under much pressure to use, to use stone and uh, tin. And I think, in a way, it, uh, uh, it frustrated you to have to deal with these materials. No, I don't, no? I don't remember that. I, f I think that the stone, I love the Paris stone. We found the quarry that we, we selected the stone up that was ubiquitous. Yes. I wanted to use the ordinary, what was happening. Uh, the lead copper was uh, still legal. It's no longer, it's toxic, but uh, uh, the, the glass fittings for the glass are galvanized. And uh, I found that very interesting. I, I, I love doing that, it's hard to do now like this, but um, I learned a lot. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, apartments uh, and, and the galleries and so on. Yes, and the building has survived, which has shrunk in respect to your first project, which was more... Yeah, I was, the, the outcome, the, the, the uh, institution that built it had a Failure. Evaporated. Evaporated, which... Went bankrupt. So we had a big opening, and that was fun. And then the next day it was closed, which was <laughs> not very much fun. But thank goodness the media, the fin cinema... Film museum took it over. Took it over. Uh, no, I think one of the major differences between the two buildings is that on the left you were working with fur materials. And the main material of this building for me is... Uh, Paris air and light that you've captured between the two roofs. So it's a more immaterial take of, at Paris, which uh, is extremely beautiful. But, but near here, there are the, the wine uh, warehouses, right? Yes. And then the... Uh, In Bercy, yes. Yeah, so it was interesting. And then the, uh, the building that crosses the street by by Shemitov, yes. Shemitov, yes. So that was the context. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but in fact, the building survives very well in this context and has taken a, a, a much strength. And I wanted to uh, show a last image, uh, which is already an old image of your first design for the second Louis Vuitton building uh, nearby. And I wanted to ask you if you could comment on uh, the current condition of this project and how it's developing uh, since it's a major question mark for everyone, maybe not for everyone in this room, but uh, uh, I think everyone is very eager to see if you will uh, build another building like this one, how you will uh, tackle the legacy of uh, Jean Dubuisson. So what is happening next door? What will happen? Well, the building is what it is. We have to respect the history, and uh, fortunately, uh, 
the grandson of Dabuisson worked in our office, so we found a good partner <laughs> to protect his grandfather's legacy. Uh, the foundation is, is going to use it for, uh, fab for many uses, but uh, craftspeople and, uh, and uh, some galleries for the kind of shows that are different than what they have in, the, in this building. Uh, so we're trying to build it back uh, for today and, and uh, not, not ruin it. <laughs> no, but you, you have a track record of dealing with existing buildings with much sensitivity. Uh, you, in particular with museums, you work in, uh, for the Norton Simon in Pasadena, which is completely invisible. Yeah, I don't have to. Uh, no, no, it's. I don't have to express myself. No, yeah. uh, or you work in Philadelphia, which is mostly underground and uh, responsive and very different to the uh, big uh, Parthenon-like building by uh, Trumbauer. So you can That's be really an interesting project because um, it, it, when Bilbao was opened and received a lot of accolades. I then, by chance, was in Philadelphia looking at a, uh, a show, Stations of the Cross, and uh, a lady, the director of the museum, came up to me and said, uh, Anne Darnancourt. Anne Darnancourt. And she said, Mr. Gary, could you uh, imagine doing a building that is not visible from the outside? having the kind of success that Bill Bell has. And I was, you know, I said, oh, sure, why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm still working on it. Uh, the, what I discovered is the 19th century building, the architect had created a structure, the, the bones, let's say, the structure of it, that shows you what to do. And so that we've spent time opening the, the, the structure to what it originally was because all of the work that was done since the, that building was built. To Including the work of Robert Venturi? We have to remove that too. Okay. I, <laughs> I feel badly about it, but uh, anyway, uh, his work was not a problem. It was the, they built uh, an auditorium in the middle that clogged all the, the circulation. And so when we take that out, the museum comes back to a very beautiful environment. And uh, so we're, we're, it's under construction. You've just opened the first section of it. Yeah. and. Uh, I don't know if I, it's going to take a long time to fund. They have to fundraise and all this crazy stuff. That okay. Well, Frank, many thanks for all your wisdom and affection and your passion. But I do want to say this show really moved me more than I can talk about it. But. Uh, it, it's, it's a game changer. The way it's, it works with the building is fine, but the story, the, the feeling of Charlotte Perrion as a person who I was not able to meet, but I've met her, her daughter, uh, the feeling that she created that lives in the, her, her work is very powerful. And, it speaks to a whole different uh, way of that people could collaborate with artists. With it's it's a different time, but it would be nice to recreate that time. <laughs> well, I think it's a perfect conclusion. Okay. Landing on our feet in this building. <laughs> <laughs>